Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, when discussing hair loss treatments, it is important to know the difference between a hair loss treatment versus an adjunct hair loss treatment. A hair loss treatment is something which in almost every circumstance is going to be absolutely essential in your fight against the slap head curse. For example, in the case of hair loss caused by androgenic alopecia, you're going to need something to tackle the androgenic component since it is, after all, the trash hormone DHT, which is progressing your hair loss, and the best mainstream treatments currently available are 5-AR inhibiting drugs like finasteride and dutasteride, which stop the conversion of testosterone into DHT. Now, an adjunct treatment is something that is effective, but is less effective as a standalone treatment and more useful when used in conjunction with a main treatment like finasteride. So, you can kind of think of it like someone at the gym incorporating the military press to enhance their lockout if their gains have stalled with the bench press. So, in that same respect, adding a growth stimulant like minoxidil could help you further stop or reverse the progression of androgenic alopecia if a 5-AR inhibitor is not enough. Most of the time, an adjunct treatment isn't even needed at all, since a treatment like finasteride or dutasteride will stop androgenic alopecia dead in its tracks in the vast majority of people who use them. But for those who need more than a 5-AR inhibitor, a growth stimulant like minoxidil is the next logical step, and the most powerful growth stimulant on the market is currently minoxidil, as I just said. Now, as great as minoxidil is, it does have one major flaw, and that is the fact that it needs to be able to convert into its active form, which is minoxidil sulfate, in order for it to actually work. And that is contingent on the presence of the sulfotransferase enzyme. Unfortunately, about 40% of people don't have sufficient quantities of the sulfotransferase enzyme in their scalps for minoxidil to work, as was seen in this research from India. So, what options do people who are non-responders or poor responders to minoxidil have? Well, there is another growth stimulant out there called stomoxidine and that may help since even though it is a growth stimulant, it works completely differently from minoxidil. Problem with stomoxidine though is that the evidence for its efficacy is based on very limited data and it appears to have a, very, a pretty minimal effect on hair growth overall. The data shows a maximal increase in hair density of only 11%. Whereas even very low dose topical minoxidil causes hair growth increases of at least 17% and normally used doses cause hair growth improvements of up to 70%. So is there a better option for minoxidil non-responders and minoxidil poor responders? Well, as it turns out, minoxidil, despite being an adjunct treatment, actually has its own adjunct treatment, which can possibly potentiate its effects and make it stronger. And that adjunct treatment is called tretinoin. It turns out that tretinoin is helpful not just because it helps make minoxidil more effective, it also is possible that tretinoin may have its own benefits as a hair loss treatment, even independent of minoxidil. So do not worry worry tunes we're going to go balls deep and cover all this information today so strap in homies because we've got a lot of data to cover here so first of all what the hell is tretinoin well Tretinoin is actually a synthetic chemical related to vitamin A. Technically, tretinoin is known as all trans retinoic acid. It's also known by its brand name, which is Retin-A. Vitamin A, on the other hand, is actually a group of compounds, including retinol, retinoic acid, and beta carotene. Thus, tretinoin is a synthetic derivative of vitamin A that is stronger than vitamin A. It is used primarily to treat acne as a cream or a gel. It has also been used to treat skin aging because it increases is collagen production, and collagen is lost with aging, which results in sagging, wrinkly skin. I personally like to use it for this purpose on a daily basis, although an important thing to remember is that using it does increase photosensitivity to sunlight, so if you do use it, preferably make sure you use it at night and you use lots of sunscreen during the day. Frankly, even if you aren't using tretinoin, you should still use sunscreen since photo damage from solar exposure is the biggest factor in premature aging compared to any other lifestyle factor, but perhaps that is a subject for another video. But anyways, there's also an oral form of tretinoin that is used to treat certain forms of uh, certain types of leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood, but I don't think we're going to go into that today, but I think it's still worth pointing out because that's important. But anyways... 
in the skin, there are certain specific receptors that tretinoin and other retinoids bind to. These receptors help decrease the stickiness of keratinocytes, which are basically just skin cells. So you get fewer blocked pores and acne, and these receptors also decrease inflammation. These effects on the skin can also increase the permeability of the skin to other drugs, which you will see might be important when, look, when it comes to looking at the effects of tretinoin combined with minoxidil and why the two drugs when used together may actually have synergistic benefits. Well, it is well established already that tretinoin is good for the skin, but what about tretinoin as a treatment for hair loss? As it turns out, tretinoin as a treatment for hair loss isn't a new thing, and it looks like tretinoin's effects on hair was discovered accidentally, much in the same way how minoxidil's effects on hair was also discovered, which was accidental. So, what's really interesting is that dermatologists using tretinoin for acne noted that some patients started growing more facial hair. Based on these reports, back in 1986, there was a study that was published that looked more scientifically at the question of as to whether or not tretinoin affected hair growth. This study was titled, quote, Topical Tretinoin for Hair Growth Promotion, unquote. And this was back in 1986, and back then not a whole lot was known about hair science, but it was felt that maybe tretinoin stimulated cell growth and thus would promote hair growth. It was also known back then that tretinoin might increase skin permeability and thus enhance the effect of the only real drug that was being looked at at the time for hair growth, namely minoxidil. In 1986, minoxidil was still being studied as a hair growth stimulant, but it was only only approved by the FDA two years later in 1988. So anyways, minoxidil was really cutting edge back then, but scientists were also looking for other hair growth stimulants as well, and tretinoin was one of those hair growth stimulants that was being investigated. So in this study, the researchers were looking at topical tretinoin alone and combined with minoxidil as well. They used 0.025% topical tretinoin, which is a pretty low concentration. For minoxidil though, they used a 0.5% solution. That's right, not 5% like we used usually used today, they only used a 0.5% solution of minoxidil, which you wouldn't expect to have much effect at all because it's pretty dilute at that point. But anyways, they looked at 56 subjects with androgenic alopecia. 12 subjects received a 0.025% tretinoin solution alone. 36% received a combination of tretinoin plus 0.5% minoxidil and five subjects received a placebo treatment. One milliliter of the solution was applied to the scalp twice a day over the course of a year. The endpoints were hair counts in a one inch diameter area of the scalp. The investigators arbitrarily defined a good response as at least 45% increase in hair counts, a moderate response as a 20 to 45% increase, and no response as less than a 20% increase in hair counts. So this table you see here shows the response to the treatment. Basically, 58% of subjects on tretinoin alone responded, but most of these responses were in the moderate category. 66% of the subjects on minoxidil plus tretinoin responded, 44% of them with a good response, and 22% of them with a moderate response. None of the control group had any response at all. So it looked like here that tretinoin may have had some benefit on its own, but it had a very good effect when combined with what we would consider nowadays to be a very tiny dose of minoxidil. So these researchers concluded that the effect of the combination of these two drugs was due to the tretinoin increasing skin permeability, allowing minoxidil to better, better penetrate through the skin. They felt that the two drugs together worked better than either drug when used by itself. There's evidence that this skin penetration theory has some validity. For example, in this study, 19 male volunteers were randomized to receive 2% minoxidil twice per day with or without 0.05% tretinoin cream applied once per day. These investigators did find that the tretinoin increased the permeability to water of the outer layer of the skin called the stratum corneum. They also found that there was about three times more minoxidil absorbed systemically when given with tretinoin. This figure here shows the levels of minoxidil in the urine after being given alone, which is the open squares, or with the placebo cream, which is the open circles, or with tretinoin, which is 
the filled in squares, which is the top curve. Clearly, more minoxidil was penetrating the skin. So maybe some of the benefits of combining minoxidil with tretinoin is due to the increased skin penetration, much like how microneedling might enhance the effects of minoxidil by increasing its skin absorption. So one angle of tretinoin's benefits comes from its ability to simply allow more of the minoxidil to reach its target destination, which of course is the hair follicle. And unlike with microneedling, you don't have to abuse the living hell out of the scalp, which in itself may have its own long-term detrimental effects, especially since the research done on microneedling showed that the people who got the best results from it gave themselves lacerations and drew blood. But if you want to know more about my take on microneedling, I'll link some of my, some of my more recent videos on the subject below about that particular topic. But anyways, that is already very good news about tretinoin as it is, but even better for tretinoin is that it turns out tretinoin might help fight hair loss on multiple angles, and that is established in this next study from our friends in Good Korea. This study is titled, quote, Efficacy of 5% minoxidil versus combined 5% minoxidil and 0.01% tretinoin for male pattern hair loss, a randomized double-blind comparative clinical trial, unquote. These investigators looked at the earlier research on tretinoin and thought that maybe if you combine minoxidil and tretinoin together, you could use minoxidil just once per day and not twice per day. Now, Topical minoxidil, it's important to point out that it does have a 22-hour half-life, so I think oftentimes it is possible to use it just once per day already as it is, particularly with 5% minoxidil. As it turns out, there is a study from 1987 that showed some improvement in results with twice-per-day minoxidil use versus just once-per-day use, but that particular study just used 3% minoxidil and not 5%. So I think the FDA approved twice-daily minoxidil because that was what was studied in the initial clinical trials for minoxidil, but there may not be that much of a difference between once per day application versus twice per day application of the drug, at least based on its long half-life. Personally speaking, I use it once per day, and I didn't notice any hair loss even after using it twice daily for many years. So ultimately, it's up to you to decide how you wish to use it, but bare minimum, you probably at least want to use it once per day. But anyways, let's get back to the study from the good Koreans. The investigators looked at 31 men with androgenic alopecia. They compared minoxidil 5% twice daily with minoxidil 5% once daily combined with tretinoin at 0.01% daily. They looked at the photographs, hair counts, and patient satisfaction as endpoints for the study. Well, what they found out was that 5% minoxidil once a day plus tretinoin at 0.01% gave the same results as 5% minoxidil applied twice daily. Here in this table, you can see that there was no difference in the results on hair counts. The same was true for all the other parameters as well. Regarding side effects, five subjects had scalp itching in the minoxidil plus tretinoin group versus four subjects in the, in the minoxidil alone group. The side effects were minor and no one had to stop treatment. The authors felt that the tretinoin increased minoxidil absorption but they also pointed out that tretinoin affects some signaling pathways as well, such as the BCL2 pathway that prevents cellular death, which is an effect similar to the effect of quercetrin that I talked about in my last video, which I'll link below. Anyways, it is a shame that these authors didn't look at the effect of tretinoin alone or at minoxidil 5% once per day alone versus minoxidil 5% plus tretinoin because that would be very interesting. But it appears likely from the limited data we have that tretinoin does indeed enhance minoxidil's effects and maybe has its own effects on hair growth as well. But it wasn't until 2019 that another mechanism was proposed for the ability of tretinoin to enhance the efficacy of minoxidil. And the awareness about this recent data might be why interest in tretinoin as a hair loss treatment may be starting to gain some traction in the hair loss community. The article I'm talking about is titled, quote, Tretinoin enhances minoxidil response in androgenetic alopecia patients by upregulating follicular sulfotransferase enzymes, unquote. It's by a number of authors, including Dr. True, of interestingly enough, who's notable for publishing this article here, which correctly identifies postfinasteride syndrome as a psychosomatic-driven delusional disorder, and his good research is what helped lay the foundation for many people, including myself, to help expose postfinasteride syndrome as little more than 
than a fictitious alt-right QAnon conspiracy theory. Anyways, by the time this article was written, it was already long established that minoxidil itself is not, in fact, the active hair growth stimulant. Rather, it is minoxidil sulfate, which is a metabolite of minoxidil, and the key to converting minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate is the enzyme sulfotransferase that I mentioned earlier. Now, it's important to note that sulfotransferase is not the same thing as sulforaphane. Sulfotransferase is the enzyme which plays an important enzymatic step in minoxidil's mechanism of action. Sulforaphane, on the other hand, was nothing more than a failed crowdfunding scam from some Portuguese guy on Reddit who tried to sell a bunch of people broccoli sprouts or some stupid shit like that. But anyways, that's not important anymore, so let's get back to this 2019 paper. In this paper, it was pointed out that, that there are non-responders to top topical minoxidil, and some of these non-responders don't respond because they have low levels of sulfotransferase in their hair follicles, like I mentioned earlier. It seems that the amount of sulfotransferase you have may be a genetic trait that you inherit from your parents. Anyways, you can actually test plucked hairs for sulfotransferase levels, and this is what the researchers did in this particular study. They took 20 subjects, half men and half women, all with androgenic alopecia, and they plucked 10 hairs from each subject's affected scalp region. They analyzed the hairs by testing the hairs for sulfotransferase levels. They then used 0.1% tretinoin cream applied once daily to the target area for five days. They then repeated the plucked hair testing for sulfotransferase levels. They found that overall, sulfotransferase levels didn't change, but they also found that specifically in subjects with low sulfotransferase levels at baseline, there was in fact an increase in sulfotransferase levels after using tretinoin. In fact, in the subjects who started out with sulfotransferase levels less than 0.4, which is a cutoff that in other studies predicted a lack of response to minoxidil, in 43% of those subjects, the sulfotransferase levels increased to be greater than 0.4 after tretinoin treatment for just five days. In other words, 43% of minoxidil non-responders became theoretically minoxidil responders after using tretinoin after just five days. This finding goes along with other research showing that retinoic acid can stimulate sulfotransferase in human cells. So the researchers concluded that the benefit of tretinoin when used with minoxidil might be, re be related to the increase in sulfotransferase levels and thus increased levels of minoxidil sulfate. They even proposed that maybe tretinoin doesn't increase minoxidil absorption into the bloodstream due to increased skin permeability. It turns out that minoxidil sulfate is more easily absorbed through the skin than minoxidil itself. So the increased amount of minoxidil sulfate formed when using tretinoin might be enough to explain why minoxidil urine levels rise when minoxidil is combined with tretinoin. Either way, the amount of increased minoxidil in the bloodstream after using tretinoin with topical minoxidil remains absolutely trivial and topical top minoxidil absorption is very slow anyways. So combining tretinoin and minoxidil is a way to improve the local efficacy of the drug without significantly increasing systemic absorption, which is of course a very important thing considering how dangerous oral minoxidil is. So I suspect that tretinoin probably potentiates the effect of minoxidil both from increasing skin absorption as well as by increasing the conversion of minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate. Frankly, I think a little more research, particularly a longer term study with more human subjects could be done to better establish how effective tretinoin is in increasing sulfotransferase activity. But even that fact aside, it is clear tretinoin helps hair loss on multiple different fronts. So it is clear that as a hair loss treatment, it is absolutely useful. Certainly, if you are a minoxidil non-responder, it is worth trying to add tretinoin because it might convert you from a non-responder into a minoxidil responder. I've used tretinoin on, on and off myself before, and I can't say for certain if it helped, but I am already a good responder to minoxidil as it is, so perhaps in my case it isn't as useful of an adjunct treatment. But if you want to use it though, what you can do is you can try to either stir the cream or the gel into your minoxidil, or you can apply tretinoin to your scalp shortly before applying minoxidil, like say 10 or 15 minutes before because it absorbs pretty quickly, and you really don't need that much of it, probably just a few beads on the problem areas, and then you can massage them into the scalp afterwards. But keep in mind though that tretinoin does cause skin exfoliation, so you will, you will likely have a period of increased 
redness and irritation. So be especially wary of sun exposure on areas of the scalp where more of the scalp is exposed to the sun. Eventually though, you do get used to it and it becomes just another routine thing, kind of like using minoxidil. And like minoxidil, it can be used just once daily, preferably at night, and then you can just go ahead and wash it off in the morning. All in all though, it is pretty convenient and if you are having trouble getting good results from minoxidil, it seems like in light of all the evidence in favor of tretinoin that adding it into your routine is a very wise decision. And with that, good luck on the path, my fellow hair loss witchers. I will see you all next time. Take care.